On this episode, we pay for garbage because we like the brand name. Welcome to Save Every Universe. My name is Alec Garcia, one of your co-hosts. I am totally right about everything because you're bad and dumb. Oh, great. I mean, do we even have to keep going? I guess not. No, it's over. All right. So my name is Robbie. I'm a British SAS officer who has risen through the ranks in my missions to constantly thwart the Soviet ultra-nationalists. Nice. Who were you last week? Last week I was, I think it's Ravio or Ravio from uh, Link Between Worlds. Nice. I still need to play that. It's a good game. And last week I was uh, Wheatley from Portal 2. I had just played through that fresh. I don't know if it's still, if it's just the standard price, it looked like Steam had just an awesome sale and you could pick it up for $1.99 and I hadn't played it since it released actually so it was nice to go down that little memory lane that is a solid solid game yeah, yeah. it's really easy to play and makes you feel good smart. dialogue <laughs> yeah. yeah so today we are talking about uh, an article that appeared in Game Informer called What's in a Name Dispelling the Myth of Game Purity by Joe Juba Jabba Senior Reviews Editor uh, Robbie brought this up and it was a really interesting topic do you want to kind of introduce sort of the, the basic gist of the article for the folks who haven't read it and then we're going to sure. kind of launch into some of the bigger questions that the article raises and give our own take on them. Yeah, it just got me thinking because the article is, so the article is kind of examining games that are part of a series or part of a legacy like Final Fantasy or Call of Duty or games that have a lot of installations. Right. And sometimes you'll run into, if you're talking, like let's say you're not a Final Fantasy fan and a fan is playing a new game, somebody who's always played it, let's say 15. Right. And you play it and you go, I don't see what the big deal is. And they're like, no, this is one of the best Final fantasy games ever but you feel like you're missing something or maybe right. it's not that great because it's just i a, think everybody's had that kind of experience at, at one time or another right yeah and that's that's kind of what this article sets out with it starts out with that and then it, he kind of discusses whether or not it's fair to judge a, a game series on its own let's take skyrim for example right should you look at skyrim just as an open world game or breath of the wild right should you compare the two or do you need to have the past uh understanding of other zelda games like right. what's the best way to evaluate and is there any a really any objective way to evaluate that at all. Just to give a, l- a little bit of context here, he's talking about playing Breath of the Wild and how there were things that stood out to him that were obviously, in his opinion, not good. Like mm-hmm. the stamina system and, and, a, and how fast the weapons broke. And he said, I thought, quote, if this game weren't called The Legend of Zelda, people would never be so forgiving, end quote. I hear that statement, o- that's the, his quote inside the quote, more quoting of him here. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that sentiment often when discussing games. You've probably said similar things when playing an entry in the series and devoted follow like Final Fantasy or Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. So first thing that jumped out of this article at me that I thought was super interesting was that idea of separating mechanics from everything else, character Mm -hmm. and visuals and the brand name of the series and the legacy of the series and all of that other stuff. And then the the mechanics, that whole idea of evaluating a game that way was a little bit strange to me. I think it's good as like an analytical exercise, but we've talked before about even with uh, some of the side-scroller platformer games, how the mechanics are just sort of recycled and they're really not that good. Right. But the art style is so cool, or the sure. you know the world that they create around it is, is really interesting. It, is there an objective way to analyze any of that? Let's start there. Yeah, I mean, is there is there an objective way? I think to some degree you can remove yourself from it, right? You can look at it just as a platformer or just as a whatever. It's hard if you're like a fan mm-hmm. or a fanboy of or whatever of the right. series. It can, I think it can be tough because there are more subtle, maybe intricate, less obvious things to the objective observer. Or whatever that that aren't lost on you like quirks or music or whatever right and as a longtime fan you're picking up on these thematic reoccurrences right. so i don't know as i was thinking about this and i i wondered if i should break these categories out a little bit so i feel like there are games that are like sequels like mass effect like right. you couldn't appreciate mass one effect of those three. games in isolation from the others right. right it would be hard to do right maybe you could do the middle one but it, it would be difficult right and you really shouldn't right. nor were you ever intended to right games like that or like destiny 2 they say it's a standalone, but right. it's kind of not. I mean, yeah. it's jarring to jump into... Well, we were talking about it a little bit before we started recording. The people who were really diehard loyalist Destiny 1 fans, even in the light of all the flaws and the XP nerfing and all the stuff that's like still coming out, there's still a lot of people who just love the mechanics of Destiny. And there's a lot of other things like microtransactions or shaders or whatever that just right. doesn't really matter because they love the mechanics. So games where I think the narrative like is a true sequel, mm-hmm. I think it's absolutely 
absolutely wrong to just be so objective and right. to try and divide the two. Right. Like, I don't think that's good at all. Because right. it's not how it's intended. Um, and then I think you get games that are like maybe Zelda or Final Fantasy, most of the Call of Duties, Mario games. Right. Games like that are standalone stories. You know, games like that, I think, are easier to apply maybe his his reasoning here, right? Because they're just standalone. They are meant to be played in a vacuum or, or they at least claim to be. I mean, the very beginning of Final Fantasy 15 is a Final Fantasy for first time and long time players alike or yeah. something along those lines. Yeah, and that, that was my beef with the article is that I think you can really analyze different games like Final Fantasy. There's probably two of them that I actually really like and there's no, to me, there's no star power even though I would put Final Fantasy 7 in one of the best games of all time. Mm-hmm. I, I Some of those like really long running series, I think you, you can objectively evaluate. I liked this game and I hated the three that came before it. Right. From okay. So so Wind Waker was the last Zelda game that I actually really enjoyed and then I picked that one up on the Wii and I was just like eh and then I didn't play Twilight Princess. I didn't Twilight Princess and then I didn't play any of them up until Breath of the Wild and I absolutely loved Breath of the Wild. So I don't know. I don't I don't buy his assertion in this article that you can't appreciate installations inside of a series without getting sucked into the star power of it. True. Well, and that's fair. I mean, especially games like Zelda and Final Fantasy that have been going on for so long. Yeah. It would be kind of weird if you liked all of them. 15 games, Final Fantasy games. They're not going to get, the developers aren't going to get every single game, like, exactly right for your particular taste. Exactly. That's crazy. Maybe all of them were liked by somebody. Yeah. But it would be pretty crazy if it was you. Because you're a big Final Fantasy fan, and there's some people who just love 10, the one with right. Titus, and that's one of your least favorites. I hate it. Like, it's just, you're not going to please everybody all the yeah. time. I, yeah. yeah, in some circles, that's blasphemy, but yeah. I couldn't stand 10, yeah. and I beat it. I beat yeah. the hell out of it, and I still was like, no, I don't like it. I think it gets trickier when you get into games that kind of straddle the narrative. Games like like Dragon Age, mm-hmm. where there are nods to the older ones, but it's not quite so... You're not following the same hero, necessarily. Yeah. Or or Fallout is a really I good I played example. Dragon Age 2, and I've never played any of the other ones, and I really loved it, um, and I didn't feel like I was missing anything stepping right. into that series. Um, yeah. And so you were able to evaluate that just as like an adve- adventure rpg yeah. I didn't feel like game. I missed anything. I didn't feel like I needed to go back and play anything, and I haven't played any of the others at all since, but I liked that game. Yeah, so Dragon yeah. Age is actually a really good example because a lot of people hated Dragon Age 2. Oh, really? And it was because it departed so much from the first one that even I found it jarring. I yeah. mean, I ultimately liked it, but I struggled to evaluate it just for what it was. Yeah. Like, I wanted it to be more like Dragon Age 1. Right. So in that sense, like, I think I think I was I was stuck. It was enumerated as Dragon Age 2. It took place during even some of the events as Dragon, same events as Dragon Age 1. So mm-hmm. I was really expecting something more like Dragon Age 1. So what I was going to say is, like, games like Fallout or the Elder Scrolls or even the Resident Evil mm-hmm. games, those kind of, they are in the same world, they're in the same, I don't know, overall scheme of things. You yeah. could put them on a timeline, right. but I, I think it's harder to distinguish those. They're not quite as isolated as like a Zelda game or mm-hmm. a Final Fantasy game, right. but they're not really... It kind of makes me laugh though, because when Breath of the Wild came out, they're like the timeline of Zelda. And like the, for a little while, that was all over the internet. That was yeah. like people trying to assemble where they all fit together. And I couldn't get my head around that. Who gives a shit? <laughs> like, right. It's always the same. You're a hero who wakes up and has to stop Ganon. And that's pretty much it with whatever the cool new twist is. Which I think that. is basically how Nintendo writes it. And right. they're like, oh shit, we got to figure out. Because yeah. if you look at some There's of never the timelines, it's like Mar- Mario is the same thing too. It's like now the now the princess is stolen. Now you have to go save right. her. Now you, yeah. So I think and you'll, with Resident Evil is the same way. You'll see like fans are like, well, why does this take place in the Raccoon City incident? Is this before or after? And you, I mean, I kind of enjoy that a little bit, but ultimately it's like, well, I don't really give a shit. I, you kind of cared about that up to like four. And then at least for me personally, and then it kind of just was like, it's another cool installment. Who really cares? Even four, I was like, oh, this takes place after two. Cool, let's let's rock. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I didn't really care. Yeah. Well, what has he been up to? Like, how's his parents? What's <laughs> Leon doing? You yeah. know, let's yeah. let's follow that arc. Like, I didn't really care. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, you're Leon. How did he get the job to save the president's daughter? Yeah, that I mean, doesn't... I'd love to see his career. What, <laughs> yeah. Does he have a resume What available? led up to that? Yeah, I, I didn't really care. I don't think anybody else really, most people probably didn't. Yeah. Again, fan, like I think diehard fans, three to five percent of people who play the series, they yeah. probably really did. And, yeah, that's probably true. And that's fine. So I, I think everyone's had the experience that this guy's talking about in this article, but in general, I don't know if I agree with the star power of a series quite as much as he's claiming it. The thing that I think is really interesting because it's just so relevant right now is that I think there is that star power can do no wrong thing that happens with developers right now. And I, I, th- I think we're seeing some of the shakeout of that, that like Bioware could like, people just loved Bioware mm-hmm. games there for a while and they've kind of screwed some stuff up recently. And right. now people are flipping out, not about a specific game necessarily. I mean, it starts there, but then they start to vilify Bioware. They start to start to vilify 
by EA or right. uh, Bethesda or whoever whoever the developer is. People are losing their shit because or Bungie with Destiny. This, these perfect developers that do everything right and make these awesome games like screwed us and how dare they? And that to me is the more interesting effect of that star power effect onto games that he's talking about. That's true. Well, and you know, on the flip side of that, I think it's one of the weaknesses a developer can have. They can yeah. kind of think that they stand on well, it's a Mass Effect game. It doesn't matter. It's a Mass Effect game. Yeah. And I think fans buy that at first, but if you don't deliver on that, you can get some like cries of betrayal. I think if you really dug into it, like it seems like that star power of a of a game series that usually goes wrong more than it goes right. Right. It certainly fades. It wears yeah. off on every series. I mean, which is why I think a lot of these developers like break off and go start their own new little studios to do something that doesn't carry any of that weird weight of their right. last mega hit. Right. I mean, Call of Duty guys come to mind. Yeah. Like when they splintered off and started respawn, Titan, and did Titanfall? Did and Titanfall? Then, yeah. But are they going to run into the same? They've had yeah, two. Yeah, it gets awesome big hits. enough and bloated enough that people just start demanding and expecting what this studio should do, and then you get these weird toxic YouTube videos of like people demanding weird shit from developers that they have no right, right. really to demand. The developers are going to make what they're going to make, and it's going to be good, and people are going to buy it or they're not. Like I don't, I really don't understand the uh, let's all get pitchforks and storm the castle shit. Buy the games you like, play the games you like, or don't. Sure. I mean, I agree with that too but I, I do think developers i think it can cause like a stagnation oh, when you're sure. just standing on the legacy of of the franchise like like the assassin's creed games i mean some of those games that they were just in call i think call of duty yeah the we're, ones are just cranking them out every year i mean you cut you start losing that even if you don't outright screw it up at some point it's like well so what well, i guess what i don't understand though is like why don't i guess it's a lot of work to find a new game that you like right and it's kind mm-hmm. of like watching a tv show that's familiar it's easier to go onto netflix and watch how i met your mother <laughs> <laughs> or like sure. The Office or whatever your comfort sitcom is yeah. like for the 56th time than it is to like gamble on a new show and have right. to sit there and engage your brain and that kind of thing. I, I feel like it's almost that. Like I don't understand why people would rather pull out the pitchforks and demand a better Assassin's Creed instead of like going and playing some cool new shit they've never played before. They're I guess that's what I'm like saying. Shadow of Mordor yeah. or something like that. Because uh, I think you're right. Like I think the expectations and the those companies, they get so big and the expectations get so high that there's no one can live up to that, which is why you see these cool little indie games at the right. fringes that people get so excited excited about because there's none of that baggage with it well and with some of these big series it seems like sometimes you're chasing the high yeah. you're chasing your mass effect 2 you're chasing your Final that game Fantasy made you 7. feel so good and it like took you to a whole new world and it's like you want that same developer to like give me my next shot give me my next yeah. hit like, you want the next final fantasy 7 yeah. or breath of the wild or wh- yeah. whatever your and I, I i think we've all been there and i understand that emotional reaction but it's it really isn't realistic to expect that a developer can do an assassin's creed every single year sure. that is that Either you're going to wait for five years or you're going to, you need to find another series that moves you or find another game that moves you. It's true, but I think it's good that developers are kind of, it seems like some developers pick, are picking up on that. Like yeah. Assassin's Creed took more time, yeah. spaced them out. Origins has gotten at least better. I mean, I haven't played it, but it's yeah. gotten better reviews than than uh, the ones for a while before it. But I think that's why Breath of the Wild was, really was a solid installment. Nintendo does take a little bit more time to really develop mm-hmm. those and to develop it in a fresh way around whatever new system they have and that kind of thing. I think they they take a little more time instead of trying to just churn one more thing out that fits the formula. And I, I also think that they they took the time to like challenge. Breath of the Wild is a good example where they did challenge their old formula. Uh-huh. They didn't necessarily challenge open world formula. Yeah. They challenged the Zelda formula. Right. Which is kind of an interesting yeah. thought that they didn't they didn't redo how open world works, but right. they redid how Zelda works. Right. And I I think because they took the time to do it, that's why they were so successful. And he this guy starts off this article talking about how they took open world concepts and did them poorly. Like you can't fast travel with your horse or you can't, or the stamina depletes too quickly or your weapons break too fast. And I'm really not a Zelda fanboy. I liked Ocarina of Time. I liked Link to the Past. I liked Wind Waker. I liked Breath of the Wild. Like there was a whole bunch in between that I'd never played or I did. I played them a little bit and I didn't like them. I'm not a blind Zelda fanboy. And I just, I didn't flat out didn't agree with some of that stuff. I felt more to me like Nintendo did their own fresh spin on those open world things. And I thought that like the weapons breaking was a cool challenge element. Mm-hmm. That um, you don't, you really don't see something where weapons break that quickly. And I, I enjoyed the challenge of like stocking my inventory before going into a dungeon or whatever. So I don't know. I see where this guy's going in this article, and I, I agree with some of the, the broad stroke points. But it's he, he goes a little of some weird places with the, with the details of it. And I, I just, I don't think the star power of a series is really quite as powerful as he's claiming. I think people decide and they play, and they, you know, the game moves you. Or you don't. The mechanics are good, or they're not. The yeah, I think that's true. I think a good way to keep that that hype though is to space it out yeah i mean people you know the 
this is the first Zelda on the Switch. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think it was the first native one on the Wii U. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I think it is. I think it, so, so people were really excited. Yeah. And when a new Smash Brothers comes out, people are going to be really excited. Yeah. I don't even, like, I want to be excited about the new Assassin's Creed, yeah. but I just can't find myself giving a shit. There's no way that they had enough time to actually make it new. They had to take the same thing and stick it in a new world. And right. And maybe they did the maybe same style didn't. of missions. It's going to be the same. But the brand becomes fatigued after yeah. a while. You yeah. know, um, I would be, if Destiny probably came out every year, I'd probably be a little tired of it. Uh, it's interesting though, because and uh, this is maybe a little bit of a side note, but those developers that take that time, like Blizzard and typically Bethesda, like with the Fallout games, they do really well. Right. So what are some of your favorite series? I, I really think, and maybe this is why I feel so strongly about it, but like I really have been trying to play more, slightly more obscure stuff and challenge myself to play slightly different things. Like some of the indie games like Gone Home or they just came out with a new one, Tacoma, Tacoma, mm. something like that. The developers have gone home. I'm picking that up. Um, SteamWorld Dig 2 was like a weird little game that I picked up randomly and I loved that thing. So I don't know. I'm I'm kind of shying away from the, some of the big AAA stuff, yeah. but not for the same reasons. I like I don't think EA's like an evil empire. Are They're doing some dumb shit and they're making some mistakes with the microtransactions, but don't put your credit card in and <laughs> buy their shitty stuff. Just sure. look, the mechanics of the game are good. Yeah, I would say over the history that I've known you, because we've been friends for some time, yeah. I can't, I was, when we were preparing for this episode, I couldn't actually think of too many series that you have been like, the next fill in the blank is coming out. I'm getting it. You were really into Halo during our Xbox days. After 4, it totally lost me. It felt like they they lost their way in yeah. 4 and they adopted just the same stuff that every other shooter was putting into their games. Aim down sight, show your hands climbing up a ledge. <laughs> like, okay. But in a Halo flavor. And right. that's fine. But they lost me after 4. But I don't know. I, like, I don't feel loyal to any particular series. Yeah. If a game is great, I'm going to play it. And I'm, I'll, I'll give just about any game a shot, including yeah, Beach Simulators. And that's probably... Well, I mean, I don't know about those. <laughs> you know, you were really into the Resident Evil series for a while, too. It seemed like everyone that came out, you would pick them up. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. I mean... But that was the same one that when it hit five, it got too over the top. It was like, ah, that's kind of disappointing. That's a little too action hero-y, and they kind of lost some of the survival horror stuff. Mm-hmm. That's that's unfortunate. And then I just went and found other survival horror games that I enjoyed and other games yeah. that I enjoyed. I really don't understand the pickup pitchforks and try to crucify the developers over trying something new with their game. Yeah. That, that's crazy to me. I don't think I've ever had quite that. That. I've never had the angry reaction. Yeah. I've had the like disappointed reaction. Yeah. I think I'm fairly loyal to series like brands. You definitely are more. I mean, right. Like, you love Final Fantasy. I love Final uh, Fantasy, but I don't love all of them. I'm not like, oh, they've all like. But you've played most of them. You've at least picked them up and tried them. Yeah. I've played one through 15. Yeah. I haven't beat one through 15, yeah. but I played them. I tried them. Yeah. I've, I've probably beat like 12 of those. I've beat most of them. Yeah. Um, I would say you're pretty loyal to um, Blizzard games in general. Yeah. Like, you've played pretty that's, much all of those. Yeah. And that's kind of, but that grew out of World of Warcraft, which yeah. is like their, <laughs> which is funny because that made me not a Blizzard fan. Yeah. But I back played like Starcraft and Warcraft one, uh, 2 and 3. Yeah. Like I, I didn't start there. Right. I kind of like became a fan later. I, I do like the Dragon Age games a lot. Yeah. I generally like Bioware games, yeah. all of them. I mean, I made myself beat Andromeda. Yeah. Just at a sheer determination. Yeah. And actually kind of liked the ending compared to everything else. So right. I was actually kind of glad I did. And the Fallout games, like I, I always try them. I maybe, I don't always get all these games like right at release. Least, right. But because they're single player games, like I always get around to them. Yeah. And I get excited about mm-hmm. some of them. Fallout's a good one, actually. I would say I'm not, I haven't like gone and played because I, the first one that I played was three and then I played four. I didn't play New Vegas. But if a new one came out, that's, I liked three and four enough that I think I would be excited for Fallout yeah. 5. Yeah. So I think, um, I think it's interesting. I think just to kind of wrap it up, I think it's important to try and evaluate a game objectively, at least to some extent, even if you're a fan, mm-hmm. because I think you can kind of get the wool pulled over your eyes or yeah. get bamboozled by some of the companies that are relying on this nostalgia. Yeah. But the flip side of that is I think it can be difficult to completely put something like Zelda in a vacuum right? because some of these games aren't trying to be the best open world game like something like Breath of the Wild is trying to be a fresh new Zelda game. Yeah. So if you're just putting That's it up against... That's a great way to say it. Yeah, if you're just trying to put it up against Skyrim and other open world sandbox games, yeah. it maybe doesn't pr- live up to it. But then you would be cheating yourself of like one of the best Zelda games ever made. Thank you for listening to Save Every Universe. If you enjoyed this episode, please go give us money at patreon.com forward slash save every universe and listen to all the episodes, all of them, every single one of them, all every last slippery one of them. (laughs) 